all things. You know, try as we might, there are some things that we humans just aren't able to accomplish on our own. Uh, for centuries, man has tried to create his own salvation. It started as early as Genesis chapter 11 with the Tower of Babel. It continues on through today with the mad scientists and their cloning experiments. Man trying to create eternal life for himself. But it's impossible. But you know what? With God, all things are possible. Even our salvation. And I'm not about to sit here and preach a salvation message, so don't worry about that. What, what my intent and my hope today is to leave you firmly planted in your brain that no matter how difficult the situation looks, no matter how impossible the odds are overwhelming, that all things are possible with our Heavenly Father. And you know, as long as we love and serve Him, we're on the winning team. Satan loses. Satan's going in the lake of fire. That's written. It, it is going to happen. So uh, you sure don't want to be with him. Let's begin today in Matthew. The book of Matthew. And I want to pick it up with chapter 19, verse 23. We ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name always. And you know what? I forgot to open in prayer. Let's do that. Let's take care of that before we start. Yahweh Heavenly Father, it is indeed a privilege to serve you, Father. We ask your blessing up, up, upon this congregation. We ask your blessings today as we gather to worship you, Father. Uh, thank you for being our Father. We love you in Yeshua Jesus' precious name. Amen and thank you, Father. Here I got to talking about that kaboom can and hairspray can and I... I just lost it. I know it. Here we go. We're going to go with Matthew chapter 19, verse 23. And it reads, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, and maybe set this up a little bit. There was a man who came to Jesus and said, You know, I'm a good old boy. What does it take to have, make eternal life? And Jesus said, You know, obey the commandments. Don't commit murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. And the guy said, All those things I haven't done. And Jesus said to him, well, then go and sell everything that you have and then come and follow me. And the guy said, oh, boy, he's a, great, a man of great wealth. And he said, no, I can't do that. And so that was his problem was that he had a lot of ill-gotten gains, and, but he didn't want to get rid of them to follow Christ. So that kind of sets us up. Now I'm going to get to it. Matthew 19, 23. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And this is specifically talking about ill-gotten gains. If you cheat somebody out of something, uh, or, and so on and so forth. There's nothing wrong with being rich with the blessings of God. 24. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, they're thinking, wow, a camel going through the eye of a needle? That's impossible. No, no one's going to be able to get into the kingdom of God if that's the requirement. And of course, this is a figure of speech. You all have heard it a dozen times that they're talking about if you have ill-gotten gains. And used to in the old cities, when they came to the gate, they closed the gate at night. But there was a little gate over to the side called the needle gate. And the top of it was shaped like an arch, and that's thus the name of needle. And so, but they, they had to take the, the backpack off of the camel and to get him through the needle gate. And the lesson is you got to get rid of your ill-gotten gains before you can enter the kingdom of heaven. But this throws the disciples, verse 25. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? No one can be saved if that's the requirement. It's impossible. But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Man can't create his own salvation. You know, we have examples, and I want you to be turning to Judges, the book of Judges in the Old Testament, chapter 6. 
we have examples where God's children went up against insurmountable odds, but God was with them. And with God, all things are possible. Kind of set this up a little bit. The Midianites had been oppressing Israel for seven years. And as always in the judges, God would raise up a judge to deliver Israel from their enemies. And he raised up this young man, Gideon. And Gideon said, are you sure you want me to do this? You know, I'm of the least of the tribes of Israel, Benjamin. And of Benjamin, my family's the poorest. And I'm the youngest among them. Are you sure you want me to do this? And uh, God uses whomsoever he will. Chapter 6 of Judges, verse 1. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Median seven years. And actually, I wanted to begin in chapter 7. Let's go, if you would, turn over one more page, chapter 7, verse 1. That kind of documents what I just said about seven years of oppression. Then Jerubbabel, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him, and we're going to learn that there were 32,000 of Israel with him, rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod, so that the host, or the camp, of the Midianites were on the north side of them, by the hill of Moray in the valley. And we're going to learn that there were 135,000 of the enemy. So Israel's outnumbered more than four to one. Moray, by the way, in the Hebrew means teacher, and uh, they are about to learn a lesson, both Israel uh, and the Midianites, by the way. Jerubbabel means Baal will contend, or let Baal fight for himself. Uh, one of the first things that God instructed Gideon to do was to tear down the altar of Baal at his father's house. And he did that. And then the people came and they were mad at Gideon's father. Bring your son out here and let us kill him. He tore down our altar of Baal. And Gideon's father said, hey, if your God, Baal, needs you to come and fight for him, you got a problem. You know, so that's how he got the name Jerubbabel. Verse 2. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt, this word is pa'ar in the Hebrew, and it means to boast. In other words, by saying that it was by their own power, their own strength, that they defeated the Midianites. They vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. And that's typical for man. When things are going well, we say, Oh, look what I did with my two hands. I'm so talented. I'm so smart. But then when things go bad, what do we do? We turn around and we go, Oh, God, why did you do this to me? Lord, help me. Verse 3. Now therefore go to, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there's one on the east side of Jordan and this one on the west. And according to the Smith's Bible Dictionary that should have been translated Mount Gilboa, Moffat chose just to translate it. Those who were afraid just went home. And there returned of the people 20 and 2,000, and there remain 10,000. They started with 32,000, 22,000 of them went home afraid. And you know, that's biblical too. That's the law. Deuteronomy 28 verse, excuse me, Deuteronomy 20 verse 8. Don't take cowards into battle. They will cause the hearts of other soldiers to turn and be cowardly and that just won't work. So uh, God's purpose in this whole thing was to uh, prove to Israel that it was He that would deliver Israel from the Midianites, not their own power. Don't take cowards into battle with you. Four. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. 10,000 against 130,000, 35,000. Bring them down into the water, and I will try them, or I'll refine them for thee there. 
And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, This shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And of whomsoever I say unto thee, This shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. And, you know, God knows the hearts and minds of, of all men. He knows who's willing to, to go to war for him and his cause. And he knows who's cowardly. So he brought down the people unto the water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, Every one that lappeth of the water with his tongue, as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by himself. In other words, separate those over on this side. Likewise, every one that boweth down upon his knees to drink. In other words, get the ones that bow down over on this side. What's, and there's a lot of discussion among scholars about what does this mean. The lapping like a dog is to bend down to the water and pick up a cup in your hand and then standing lap the water out of your hand. Those who bend down are accustomed to bending down to worship Baal, is the thought of some. Some say that the men who stood to drink were anxious for battle. I, I still say that God knew the hearts of the men and he had 300, count them, 300 that he wanted to go up and war against these 135,000. That was the number that God was looking for, was 300. Verse 6. And the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were 300. 300 in biblical marriage means the spirit of Almighty God. All things are possible with God. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. Verse 7. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the three hundred men that lapped will I save you. I would imagine about this time that Gideon is thankful that he asked for that fleece with the dew coming down. And then he said, Well, you know, suffer me, allow me to, to, to have you give me another sign. You remember the, the, the piece of wool was wet and the ground around it was dry. And then Gideon said, well, just one more thing, you know, let's do it again tonight, but this time make the ground all around it wet with dew, but the fleece stay dry. And the Lord said, okay. And I imagine about this time Gideon said, 300, huh? Okay. Uh, I'm glad we did that thing with the fleece. And deliver the Midianites unto thine hand, and let all the other people go, every man unto his place. Send the rest of them home. Oh, by the way, you guys leave your trumpets. We're going to need them. So the people took victuals in their hand. In other words, those were going home, left food for the 300. And their trumpets. And he sent all the rest of Israel, 9,700 that were remaining, every man unto his tent, and retained those 300 men. And the host of Median was beneath him in the valley, 135,000 against 300. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, unto Gideon, Arise, get thee down unto the host, for I have delivered it unto thine hand. No reason to fear. And you know, God knows, though, that our flesh is weak. But it's our spirit, and that's what I really want you to get out of this today, is that it's our spirit that is strong. And as long as we put our confidence in God and try the best we can to keep our flesh pushed down, tamped down, if you will, and make it your spirit self that rules how you live, that's what's important. That's when God can really use you. Verse 10. But if thou fear to go down, again, the flesh is weak, and God knows it, go thou with Phura, thy servant, down to the host. In other words, you're going to hear the enemies uh, uh, talking, and it's going to be the fact that it's actually they who are fearful, and therefore you can take courage and strength in the fact that the enemy is afraid. Verse 11. And thou shalt hear what they say, the Midianites. 
and afterward shall thine hands be strengthened to go down unto the host. Then went he down with Phura, his servant, unto the outside, or the furthest edge, of the camp, of the armed men that were in the host. In other words, the very edge of the camp. And the Midianites and the Amalekites, they were allied with them, and all the children of the east lay along in the valley like grasshoppers, locusts. There was a bunch of them for multitude. And their camels were without number as the sand of the sea side for multitude. Three hundred. And God are in the minority, or majority. These are the minority and should be afraid. And when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream, this is a, a Midianite, unto his fellow and said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, no doubt God caused that dream, and lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Median, and came unto a tent, and smote it that it fell and overturned it, that the tent lay along. This the tent, the last phrase, is with the definite article. And it indicates that it's the general's tent, or the, the, the leader's tent. So what this dream that God put in this Medianite's head was that this piece of bread, which is Gideon and his 300, come rolling into the camp of the Medianites, hit the tent of the general, and put the general's tent in ruin. Cut the head of the snake off, and everything else kind of falls into place. And his fellow answered and said, This is nothing else save the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. For into his hand hath God delivered Median and all the host. Divine intervention, uh, a sign to Gideon that all is going to go well. And it was so when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof that he worshipped always a good thing to do, thank the Lord, and returned into the host of Israel, all 300 of them. Gideon, by the way, if you translate it, means the cutter down, and uh, he could cut it for sure. And said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered into your hand the host of Median. And he divided the 300 men into three companies, Three, of course, in biblical numerics, the number of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One hundred, the number of election of grace. And he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and the lamps within the pitchers. And these pitchers, you could think of it as like a pail. But what they're doing is concealing the light of the, the, the lantern the, the candle, if you will, in the picture, so the Medianites can't see them coming. You see, they're going to keep the lights hidden until they get up close to the Medianites. Usually, there's only one trumpeter per company. They, got, they kept the trumpets, you remember? 300 trumpets we have. Let's see, we got one trumpeter per company, and there's 300 trumpets. There's 300 companies of Israelites. That's the plan. And he said unto them, to his men, Gideon, Look on me and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall ye do. You watch me and do exactly as I do. When I blow with the trumpet, I and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of all the camp, and say, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. That was the interpretation of the dream, you remember back in verse 14? So he's latching onto that and going with it. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came unto the outside of the camp, in the beginning of the middle watch, we're talking about at midnight was the change of the middle watch, and they had but newly set the watch. Many of them were tired, and as they were going back to their tents, probably thinking, oh, finally I can get some sleep. And they blew the trumpets and break the pictures that were in their hands, the noise of the breaking pictures 
and the light just appearing out of nowhere and the 300 trumpets, they think, oh my goodness, we're surrounded by Israelites. You know, if you got light circling you, you don't know what's behind those lights. You can't see what's behind those lights. So they think there's just tons and tons more Israelites, just the 300. They don't know that. And the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands to blow with all. And they cried, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp, leading enemy again to believe that there were more behind them. And all the host ran and cried and fled. We see God totally in control of this situation. The, the barley bread has rolled into the general's tent and put it in ruin. And the 300 blew the trumpets, and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow. In other words, the Midianites started fighting each other and killing each other. It's not the first time that happened, or the last, Second Chronicles chapter 20. Jehoshaphat was fighting against the Ammonites, the Moabites, and the Edomites. And the Lord caused the Moabites and the Ammonites to start killing the Edomites. When they finished killing all the Edomites, they turned on each other and wiped each other totally out. God in control. With God, all things are possible. Even throughout all the host, and the host fled to Beth Shitta in Zerirath, I'll get it out, Zerirath, and to the border of Abel Mihola unto Tabath. Abel Mihola, only mentioned one other time in the Bible, and it's the home of Elisha the prophet. And the men of Israel gathered themselves together out of Naphtali. These are what's left of the 9,700 who weren't cowards, but left. They're gathering back again. And out of Asher, and out of all Manasseh, and pursued after the Midianites. The Midianites are trying to get to the Jordan River, which if they could get across it, they would almost be home. So that would be the, their safe haven if they could get to the Jordan. They're going to be cut off at the pass. And Gideon sent messengers throughout all Mount Ephraim, the larger of the ten tribes, saying, Come down against the Midianites and take before them the waters of Beth Bara and Jordan. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and took the waters unto Beth Bara and Jordan. Beth Bara means house of the ford or, or crossing place of the Jordan. And they took two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb, and they slew Oreb upon the rock Oreb. This is mentioned by Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 10, verse 26, is, is a great victory for Israel. And Zeb they slew at the winepress of Zeb, and pursued Median, and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of Jordan. They took care of business. And Again, God in control there. We had, we're going to find, you would, if we continued on, you'd find in chapter 8 that there were 120,000 of the Midianites, Amalekites, and the children of the east that were slain in the initial battle, which left 15,000 of them. But Gideon chased them down and took care of business with them as well. 300 against 135,000. And you know what I want you to think about, let me ask you a question. When, when, when you're delivered up before the Antichrist and the rest of the world is worshiping Antichrist, what do you, what do you suspect the odds are going to be? How, how many are you going to be outnumbered by that are worshiping the Antichrist and you're over here in this little bitty bitty group, God's elect, standing ready to witness I want you to remember, with God, all things are possible. There was a group who were outnumbered even worse than Gideon and his 300. Turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 6. Second Kings... Chapter 6, 
Oh, let's pick it up with verse 8. Then the king of Syria, I think this was probably Ben-Hadad of 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 1, warred against Israel and took counsel with his servant, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. In other words, he's getting ready to lay siege to Israel. Now we're talking about Israel. The split's already happened. Judah's off doing their thing. We're talking about Israel. Jehoram, by the way, is the king of Israel at this time. He's Ahab's son. And you, you, you know what a crud Ahab was with his wife Jezebel. So, but at this point in time, God is trying to get his children's attention. That's why he sent the prophets. Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, Jeremiah. The list goes on and on and on. He sent the prophets trying to talk some sense into his children. And, but that's the situation here. But Benadad is saying he's getting ready to lay war against Israel. And here's where I'm establishing my camp from which to make war is what the point is. Verse 9. And the man of God, this is Elisha, sent unto the king Jehoram of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. In other words, don't take your eyes off of this place. Keep Israelitish troops in this area, because this is where Benadad and the Syrians are setting up. And, and we got that, uh, I don't know, verse 10. And the king of Israel sent to the place, he sent troops there in other words, which the man of God told him and warned him of and saved himself there, not once nor twice, more, more than twice he saved himself. Let me ask you, did he save himself? No. God saved them by sending the prophet Elisha. With God all things are possible. Benadad starts becoming suspicious of his own men. Who's telling Jehoram where we're going to be? Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. How did Jehoram know? And he called his servants and said unto them, Will ye not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? There's a spy amongst us, and no doubt heads, a head, if not more than one, were going to roll. And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha. The fact of the matter is, Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. Elisha knows what is being talked about in your very bedroom. And everything else that's going on in your bedroom as well. Now let me ask you. If someone knew what was going on in your bedroom and they weren't in your bedroom, what does that mean? That means somebody is telling Elisha what's going on in Benadad's bedroom. I think if I'd have been Benadad, I'd have been smart enough to go, you know what, I think I heard Mama calling. And I think I'm going back to Syria with my troops. But that's not what happens. Stick with me. 13. And he said, this is Benadad, Go and spy where he is, Elisha, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Genesis chapter 37. This is where the patriarchs sold their brother Joseph uh, to the Ishmaelites. It means two wells, and it's about 12 miles north of Samaria, Samaria being the capital of the ten northern tribes at this point in time. 14. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host, 180,000 Syrians. And they came by night and compassed the city about, encircled Elisha. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early, this is uh, Elisha's armor bearer, and gone forth, behold, an host 
compass the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, referring to Elijah, how shall we do? What are we going to do? There's 180,000 of the enemy. And he, Elisha, answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. When you're on God's side, you're in the majority. I don't care if it's going up against 180,000 or 180 million. With God, all things are possible. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes, referring to his armor bearer, that he may see, allow him to see into that dimension. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain, in other words, upon which Dothan stood, was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. I think these are probably the same horses that we talked about in Ezekiel chapter 1, the highly polished bronze, the amber vehicles. And you know, what an awesome sight. Can you imagine what that armor bearer thought when he saw the armies of God circling that mountain? You know, seeing is believing. And, and Elisha did the right thing. He said, let him see into that dimension. Then he won't be afraid. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. 180,000 of them blind, just like that. And you know, God can open eyes. God can close eyes. More important on a spiritual level that your eyes be open. And Elisha said unto them, they're all blind, remember. This is not the way. You're going the wrong way. Neither is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to Samaria, the capital of Israel. Now that's a, a pretty picture right there, folks. Here, here we got 180,000 enemy Syrian troops that have been struck blind. It's 12 miles to Samaria. A picture in your mind, Elisha saying, come here, take my hand. Now you take the next guy's hand, the next guy, next guy, next guy, and I'm going to lead you to Samaria. And so here they are going 12 miles across the desert, and I can hear the Syrians going, you know what, we are so lucky this guy came along. He, he, he was such a nice guy. He told us, I'm not Elisha, but I know where he is. He's over in Samaria. And they're going, how lucky are we? And it came to pass when they were come into Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes and they saw. And behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. I mean, right smack dab in the capital of the, the ten northern tribes, Israel. And the king of Israel said unto Elisha, when he saw them, this is Jehoram, the son of Ahab, My father, or counselor, you could translate, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? I mean, Jehoram's excited. He goes, here, the enemy's delivered right into our hands. Should I kill them? And he, Elisha, answered, Thou shalt not smite them. Wouldest thou smite those whom thou hast taken captive with thy sword and with thy bow? You don't kill and smite prisoners of war. Set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. The lesson to the Syrians and uh, the, the Israel is that no human force can overpower the Lord. Verse 23, And he prepared great provision for them, and when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away, sent them on their way home. And they went to their master. So the bands of Syria came no more into the land of Israel. 
That doesn't mean that the army of the king of the Syrians will be back because he most assuredly will, but we're going to stop there. You know, not only are all things possible with God, I want you to take home with you today that all things are possible to those who believe. Do you believe? Yep, I know you believe. So I want you to take home today that everything is possible. There's some conditions on that. We're going to cover them. Turn with me to Mark chapter 9, verse 14. New Testament. Mark 9, 14. And it reads, And when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude, the, the he, of course, is Jesus, about them, and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed, and running uh, to him, saluted him. Now, the... Uh, transfiguration on the mount has just occurred and, and I think part of the attraction of the people to him is that some of the effects of the transfiguration possibly still there I can't document that that's just my personal opinion but you remember when when Moses when when he was in the presence of the Lord how he shone his face shined and it was such a, it scared the other people. He, he had to wear a, a veil over his face until the shine went away. It's kind of like before broadcast, my wife comes over and she tries to make the shine go away with makeup. And I don't want to go there, never mind. But anyway, I think he's got the shine still on him, that Holy Spirit touching him when, when he was in that transfigured body on the mount, my opinion. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed. We got that, verse 16. And he asked the scribes, what question ye with them? Why, what are you questioning among yourselves? He knew what they were up to. And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit, dumb and death spirit, we'll see. And wheresoever he taketh him, in other words, wherever the Spirit takes my son, he teareth him, and foameth, and gnashes with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. And most assuredly, Jesus had given his disciples the power to cast out demons in his name. Uh, Luke chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. And he answered him, Jesus answered the father of the man that was possessed, and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him. And when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him. And he fell on the ground and wallowing, foaming. No doubt the spirit recognized who stood before them. You remember on more than one occasion, a spirit would say, Thou son of David. They knew exactly who Jesus was. They'd had encounters with him before, no doubt. And he asked his father, Jesus asked the father of the man, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. Since his childhood, he's been afflicted with this demon. And oft times it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. If you can do something. What, what is that an expression of? Doubt. This man doesn't have the faith that Jesus can cast out this lunar tick, is what we find out in the book of Matthew that he's dealing with here. Jesus said unto him, he turns the if back around, the shoe on the other foot, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. That's you, you believe. And 
And we're going to put a few parameters on you here. I don't want you taking off, tearing out in the parking lot here, going, okay, I got it now. All things are possible to me. We got a few guidelines to go with, and we'll cover them too. But if you believe and you're doing it for the right reason, all things are possible. Nothing impossible. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. That's an honest response. He says, I, I, did, I didn't believe at first. I had doubts. But help me get over that. The honest answer. No if this time, did you notice? When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter no more unto him. And the spirit cried, and rent him sore, and came out of him. And he was as one dead, insomuch that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he was coming to his house, his disciples asked him privately, off to the side, Why could not we cast him out? And he said unto them, This kind, referring to lunatic in Matthew chapter 17, verse 15, can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. And I hope you feast on God's word and fast on the traditions of men. In conclusion, we're going to put a couple guidelines or parameters on this power that we have to accomplish anything. Mark chapter 14, verse 26, in conclusion. And where we're going here, it's the, the Last Supper has, has come. The time is near that Christ would pay the price on the cross, the crucifixion. Verse 26, Mark 14. And when they had sung an hymn, no doubt one of the psalms, they went out into the Mount of Olives, overlooking Kedron, out the east gate of Jerusalem. And Jesus saith unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7, minor prophet. But after that I am risen, and he knew I am going to rise, he had showed them he was going to rise. He was going to resurrect. After I am crucified, I will go before you into Galilee. In other words, when this is all over, I want you to meet me in Galilee. Did any of them go to Galilee? No. <laughs> there were two of them that went to Emmaus, which means warm springs. They were walking along, and Jesus walked alongside them and goes, Hey, what's going on? They didn't recognize him. Where have you been, man? Haven't you heard the news? Jesus was crucified on the cross, and, and we don't know what's happened to him. He's in the tomb. And da -da -da -da. Wah, 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 wah. They didn't meet him in Galilee. But Peter said unto him, Although all shall be offended, yet will not I. And Jesus saith unto him and to Peter, Verily I say unto thee, that this day, even this night, before the cock crowed twice, thou shalt deny me thrice, three times. And it would come to pass. And he spake the more vehemently, Peter did. If I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. Likewise also said they all, all of them piped in and said, No way. Would we deny you, Christ? They all did. And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he saith to his disciples, Sit ye here while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John, and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. And saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here. And watch, and this I think leading up for us is a, a symbol of the hour of temptation. Will you watch, or are you going to fall asleep like Peter, James, and John did? 
And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. Verse 36, and he said, Jesus praying, Abba, which is Aramaic for father. In other words, Father, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. All things are possible with you, Father. I'm asking you, let this cup, the cup of wrath is what he's talking about. Jesus is saying, isn't there some other way than, than, than at the beginning of the Lord's day that the cup of God's wrath be poured on the people? Isn't there another way? But if it is your will, Father, all things are possible with you. That's the parameters we have, beloved. It's not our will that's important. It's our Heavenly Father's will. And yes, all things are possible for those of you who believe as long as you keep those parameters in mind. Make it His will that's accomplished, not my own or our own self-will. And He cometh and findeth them sleeping, all three of them, and saith unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldest not thou watch one hour? And I think this is, again, for our benefit. We will stay awake. 38, to conclude, watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. Our flesh is weak. And, but I want you to always remember, keep it right in the forefront of your spiritual mind, all things are possible with God. I don't care how difficult the situation is. I don't care how insurmountable the odds might be. Your Father's in charge, and with Him all things are possible. Let's go to His throne. Yahweh Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your written Word, Father. We thank You that, uh, for Your encouragement, Your words, Father, that teach us what is going to happen in these end times, Father. Continue to open our eyes, open our ears, Father, that we continue to learn from your word day in and day out. We seek you, Father. We want to help. We want to serve you, Father. Uh, educate us. Uh, send your Holy Spirit to enlighten us, Father, so that we can serve you and serve you well. We know with you all things are possible, and we are here to serve. In Yeshua Jesus' precious name. Amen, and thank you, Father. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Jesus' name that gives us his credentials as a Christian. We claim our Christianity when we're talking to the Heavenly Father, which is important. Now, as far as understanding the Trinity, I, I can't take time in, in this short period I have here with your question, Steve, and, and I guess it's gonna sound like I'm trying to sell CDs and tapes, so be it. You need to order Pastor Arnold Murray's work, uh, the, the Nature of God, and that goes into, it's an hour, hour and 10, 15 minute study on our teaching concerning the Trinity. But basically, you have to consider there are different offices that God holds. And there are different offices that Satan holds. He was the uh, serpent in the Garden of Eden. He's uh, the old dragon. He's Lucifer in Isaiah chapter 14. He's the Antichrist in, in, in Ezekiel and the Psalms that we've been studying. So. He has different roles. God has different roles is a good way to think of it. Felicia in Texas. First, thank you for your teachings. You're, you're sure welcome. 
is there any way you can know in the flesh who the third are that fell and who are the other two thirds? And no, uh, God erased uh, erases our memories when we're born in the flesh. We, we have no, which is here in the second earth and heaven age. We have no uh, memory of the first earth and heaven age for a reason. Uh, he wants those third who followed Satan at the Satan's rebellion in the first earth and heaven age to love him and follow him. So uh, he doesn't want anyone prejudged, if you will, based on what they did in the first. That's the whole reason for this the second earth and heaven age. If you haven't a clue what I'm talking about, you need to order three world ages also on that list of suggested tapes uh, or, or CDs for new students. If you don't understand the three world ages, you will never understand, as Paul called it, the mystery is of God. Allen in Wisconsin, I was wondering about predestination. Where did we originally come from? I know God, but can you explain further? Well, and here I've got a note to, for that you need to order three world ages. We just recommended for that. It's critical to understanding the mystery of God. Uh, as it's written in Ephesians chapter uh, 1 verse 4, uh, God said, you know, I, some of you I predestined before the foundations of the world. That means the katabol in the Greek language, foundations of the world. That was Satan's rebellion. And God knew those who stood with him in a very special way against Satan when Satan rebelled against him in the first uh, earth and heaven age. Patricia in South Carolina, I like to eat pork. If I continue to eat pork, will it keep me from going to heaven? And the answer to that is no. Uh, eating pork is a violation or breaking of the health laws. God created our flesh bodies. He knows what makes them tick. He knows what's good for them and what's not. And pork, uh, swine's flesh as it's called in, in Leviticus chapter 11, is not on the list of foods that God thinks are acceptable for man to eat. But eating pork is a sin against your flesh, not against your soul. Jan in Kentucky, are God and Jesus the same people? I had that question earlier, I think I'll leave it at that. But again, different roles, and uh, just as Satan has multiple roles, so does our Heavenly Father. But the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one entity. Wherever one of them is, the other two are always there as well. Kenneth in Georgia, when was the first soul made? Well, millions and millions of years ago. I think uh, all souls were created at the same time. Uh, and that's what your second question. Were all souls made the same time? Yes, I believe so. So in essence, we are all the same age as far as our spiritual bodies are concerned. And of course, age in a spiritual body really doesn't uh, cover the topic at all because age has no effect on a spiritual body. As I said, millions and millions of years ago, I believe God created all souls. Stephen in Minnesota, is Easter the same thing as Resurrection Day? Or what day is the Resurrection Day celebration and can it be figured out what day that is? Well, here at the chapel, Steve, we celebrate Passover. And you can figure out when Passover is from God's Word, if you're familiar with the solar calendar. Uh, Leviticus chapter 23 tells us that uh, from the beginning of the year, the Hebrew year began at the spring equinox. And if you count from there 14 days, and then that evening, which is the beginning of the next day, uh, as far as the Hebrews were concerned, the 15th, in other words, would be the Passover. And you can read about that in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 5. Easter is recorded one time in the New Testament in the book of Acts. It's a bad translation. The word that it's translated from is Paschal, which is Passover. Easter is a pagan spring festival 
uh, filled with uh, reproduction, quick like a rabbit. Let's roll some Easter eggs in the groves and look it up in your Webster's Dictionary, college edition, seventh edition or early. It'll tell you Easter is a spring pagan holiday. Chris in California, I know Satan comes before Christ as the Antichrist. I want to be a witness for Christ, but how do I do this? He will be in Jerusalem, I will be in California, and I don't have the money to go to Jerusalem. Well, I, I guarantee you, if he wants you there, he will arrange your transportation. And you know what? I don't think it'll be on one of the major airlines that we are all familiar with. How will I be a witness for him? Will it be over television? Uh, are they going to ship me over there? The latter, you've got it. If he wants you there, he will get you there. Uh, just be ready mentally and physically and prepared with the gospel armor on as you can read about in Ephesians chapter 6. That's the only way you're going to stand against the fiery darts of Satan. Michael in Arizona, concerning the elect, are the black races with the black? I don't understand your question. I am black and I am trying to figure out where uh, I fit into all this. Revelation chapter 21 verse 24, in the eternity there will be a temple and the temple is our heavenly father and the lamb and the kings and queens of the nations, which is ethnos in the Greek language, will have the right to come in their presence. You have a role in leading your people to the true Christ, just as God's elect have a role in leading their people to the true Christ. I'm out of time. I love you a great deal because you enjoy studying our Father's Word in depth. It makes your Father's Day when he looks down and you have his letter he wrote to you opened up and studying his word. It makes his day. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, uh, you bless God. He will always return the favor and bless you. Uh, most of the thing, the one thing that's most important, beloved, stay in his word every day. And your Father's word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800 643 4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel. Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.